Okay, thanks. Right now, this is a, a, an architecture uh, diagram of the way that we identified or built this proof of concept. It's um, based mostly on how the, the uh, LEO code was originally constructed and how we uh, chose to implement this in uh, a very uh, rapid, uh, agile way. So it's not built in a way that you would ever want to deploy this in a production environment. The key thing here that we did was we uh, kept the bulk of the activity on the client side so that we had complete control of the environment. We built the connector out of a uh, heavily forked version of the LEO code base for requirements management, change management, and architecture management. And we then deployed that into a, a local Jetty application server which uh, in the case of normal development process, we actually ran that as an Eclipse plugin so that we could get rapid turnaround at debugging in the Eclipse uh, development environment. So that whole thing then speaks over to our more production-oriented server stack here. And the, the normal team center Im implementation uh, has a uh, four-tier architecture, so there's the, the database resource tier, it's uh, an Oracle database in our case. There's an enterprise tier and a web tier that runs in a server environment in a, uh, a data center. And these things are the key points to tie into Team Center. Uh, this is all production version 9.1 Team Center. Our, our idea of a production implementation here would look quite different, and in general, we would expect that the OSLC connector would be housed and hosted inside this Team Center web tier. So this whole area of the client side would go away, and in fact, you basically end up with just what you already have in a normal Windows client or, or any kind of a client that has a uh, web browser that's able to go and speak to these mid-tier services. Or in the case of uh, Team Center, it has a four-tier rich client, it's basically a Java client that uses the same services to speak to Team Center but it's a, a more rich client. Very, uh, It's built on Eclipse, so it's very much like what you might expect with the uh, rational Eclipse client. Now, as I mentioned, we're these things are all based on the Rio project. We uh, took advantage of a lot of good work that was done to build all this early infrastructure and it used we used reused the code patterns and the code base that was uh, established there but we uh, had to do some significant rework on it so we basically forked the uh, code and started over again or didn't start over but but significantly uh, rebuilt some things we needed to do Data model mappings. Now, the data model mappings that we have are for, as I mentioned, the requirement domain, the change request domain, the resource or the architecture management domain, and a new domain that we're proposing called the product domain. That's a, a new resource type that will probably be required to satisfy some of this use case PLM world. Um, these mappings that you see here 
our mappings onto object types in Team Center that exist in our uh, normal data model here at GM. Some of them are uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a, a normal out-of-the-box Team Center in installation, but uh, they're equivalent to types that exist in an out-of-the-box situation. And we built this mapping set so that it was quite configurable. We could easily change as needed if uh, we end up uh, contributing this code to the LEO project and you wanted to take advantage of it, you could probably easily map it to your, your own data model. Um, there's a couple of key assumptions that we ran into in the OSLC world that are somewhat different than what you would expect from a normal relational or object-oriented world that uh, typical PLM systems, Team Center included, uh, satisfy. Uh, the open world assumption is really important. And this, this is something that um, can't be overstated, I think. People have to get their head around the fact that in the OSLC world and the semantic web world in general, the the notion of a a resource existing or not existing in this case does not imply that it doesn't exist somewhere. It just implies that you can't see it. So um, just because your query result comes back empty doesn't mean necessarily that a resource doesn't exist somewhere to satisfy that query. It's just that your query couldn't get to it at that time. It's important also that clients have to be tolerant of the notion of new data and unknown data elements showing up. So go go to the semantic web standards web page reference there and, and really try to get your head around that. Now the other the other thing that on the other side of the coin uh, the relational object-oriented closed world assumption says that if you don't find something, it doesn't exist. And it, as far as you're concerned, it never exists and you don't want it to exist. It's important that we understand the difference here. Uh, also, the client being very tightly coupled to the data model is important in the, the normal relational world. If your client doesn't correctly match the existing data model, uh, you will fail, break, or there will be other issues. So uh, it's very important that the data that's there, that's by the, the assumptions that the client is built around, doesn't, you'll have problems. There was also a bit of a, a mismatch in the LEO architecture as it originally existed that forced us to, to do this, this forking at a certain level of the code. The original design and the design as it exists today, uh, for good reason and important reasons, has this RDF triple store as its back end. The nice notion of a triple store that you can save things or it's LC resource directly that works well. The problem is that that doesn't match the relational model, doesn't match the, the team center way of thinking about things. So we have a, a service oriented architecture by the team center product supports out of the box that thinks about things at a higher level of abstraction. It's at an object level. So an item a revision, a V definition, uh, and lots of referential concerns. So we had to rebuild this thing and basically lop off the triple store part of it and put it on top of Team Center SO. That posed some challenges, and certainly uh, from a production implementation standpoint, there's a lot of loose ends that we all didn't actually follow down and, and track down exactly how to solve these problems, but we think they're all solvable. Um, we identified and implemented some proposed 
time extensions, the version, the view definition, and uh, at least a, an early representation of variant conditions, how you would do variant conditions in this situation, and that across to OSLT resources. So, I think yeah, yeah. So, take a quick uh, break to see if there's any questions. That's right. So there was a question that came through in the chat, um, and I, I'll just read it direct, and then I'll, I'll interpret it if I if needed. Did this uh, POC of the Team Center client use any OSLC resources? So I, I'm going to assume that um, use means either consuming it from the Rational Team concert or kind of making it look that way to Rational Team Concert and providing it to it. Um, yeah, we'll see that in a second. We were able to provide some resources to Rational Team Concert. We never um, went the other direction and tried to consume Rational Team Concert resources and um, security model or complex that direction. And we didn't really feel that that was necessary to approve the concept, so we didn't mm -hmm. do that part. Now, uh, beyond a proof of concept, then do you think that that would actually be a useful scenario to have addressed? Oh, yes, definitely. In a, in a production setting, you'd, you'd absolutely have to be able to do both. Excellent. 